All right, everyone, let's get this party started. Looking at the syllabus, if we look at where we are now and what's coming up, um, we start getting into some very interesting readings. We've, we're done with the uh, Lockman readings. Um, everything else will now be uh, PDFs uh, on Gaucho space. And other things, uh, final paper will be due November 29th. Now I should, I'm going to be updating the syllabus because uh, through the weeks of week six and seven, um, you can upload the rough draft. And for the rough draft, I'll send out the instructions. Basically, we want a thesis statement, a few, four bullet points regarding the main points of your, your paper, and then also four peer-reviewed sources that you're going to be using um, in addition to one of the sources uh, from, from this class. So anyway, I will have more to say about that uh, in the classroom on Wednesday. So if you have any, you know, questions, may, maybe it'd be good to bring them, bring them up then. Uh, otherwise, you can just send me an email. So we do have one reading this week that I think is probably the, <laughs> has the coolest title at least, uh, The Dark Enlightenment and the Anthropocene Readings from the Book of Third Nature as Political Theology. Um, there's a lot there. So um, just jump right in. So some of you are probably familiar with this image if you've taken some political science or maybe some history classes, maybe some philosophy. This is the Leviathan that Thomas Hobbes uh, writes about. So the topic this week is political theology. And political theology is something that's been around for a long time, but hasn't really gotten the, um, some of the attention that it should probably receive. Um, so the the political theology piece comes out of uh, this journal called Telos um, that writes about some of these things and other other kind of topics that aren't incredibly popular. So this week we'll be talking about this dark enlightenment, this idea that, you know, progressivism is a bad thing and um, there needs to be hierarchies of power and so on and so forth. And we find this, some of this in sort of scholarly literature, but a lot of it on the internet, uh, online in ones and zeros. We see just new systems of thought developing as well as old systems emerging, uh, once again. So I, believe I have said this already, and if I haven't, I'll state it again. Um, uh, Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher, said that the fundamental concept in social science is power, kind of like energy is the fundamental concept in physics. And you can't really understand social dynamics unless you understand power, who has power, how it's exercised, uh, and so on. Well, we have a couple of relatives that we can we can look at and see how similar and different we are. So, in terms of our uh, us being primates, we're probably closest to uh, the bonobos and the chimpanzees, somewhere kind of right in between. And you see the differences here. So, things like tool use, um, causal reasoning, you know, what caused what, spatial memory, aggression. All of these things uh, are more characteristic of chimpanzees. Now you look at gaze following, you know, looking at each other's eyes, food sharing, cooperation, social play, all of these much more prevalent uh, amongst bonobos. Bonobos basically have a society that, you know, the hippies at Woodstock in the 60s would have wanted to create just and <laughs> basically free love and free sex, non-monogamous, uh, not necessarily heterosexual, uh, basically no limits there. And then the chimpanzees, what's kind of interesting is it's very, very, very rare that you would ever see them sort of cooperate, f cooperating with something that isn't involved in aggression. Um, we there was just a report just a few days ago about uh, a group of chimpanzees that attacked and killed these gorillas. Um, and, you know, it was 
just kind of showed how aggressive uh, the chimpanzees can be. Um, so as I said, you know, <laughs> we're as humans, we're kind of right in between there. We're, we do all this stuff. We're aggressive, but we also cooperate. Uh, we can share food, but we can also, you know, be pretty selfish. <clears throat> But as I said, you know, if you want to dive into this deeper, because again, we'll see um, in the coming weeks why this is important for understanding uh, politics. Because we see a lot of these same sort of basic characteristics regarding leadership and um, groups and group psychology, social psychology. We see it in, in many uh, primate societies. And Franz de Waal, probably one of the you know top researchers, top primatologists uh, in the world. You know, if you have time to read one of his books, I would highly recommend it. Otherwise, he's got a number of uh, very good talks online where he talks about some of his experiments and some of the monkeys he works with and so on. Well, all right, jumping straight into when humans thought they were so much more <laughs> reasonable than uh, than the great apes, uh, the Enlightenment. So this is a period in time which discussed before, um, where a lot of modern scientific reasoning comes out of, and the idea here for Max Weber was you know one of the founding sociologists. Uh, Weber basically, you know, he spent a lot of time studying all these different societies around the world, looking very deeply into different forms of religion, different types of government, clan lineages, like musicology, and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and he made this very kind of famous argument that many social scientists, sociologists, and others have more or less adopted. And that basically is this idea of rationalization. And then he says, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. And sometimes he refers to this as the iron cage of rationality, because it's you're kind of stuck in this um, you know, in this kind of set path in in modernity where, you know, you work hard to succeed, you go to school, you go through all the steps and so on. And the idea is that, you know, you're supposed to, to have a good life <laughs> as a result of that. Um, and Weber was saying that, you know, sometimes that sort of approach to living can keep you from seeing, you know, other, other aspects uh, of the world that may be important, um, may be meaningful. But he did think that there would be this increasingly, this increasing disenchantment with the world. Well, what does that mean? Disenchantment, basically taking the wonder and mystery out of, out of the, the cosmos, the world, whatever you want to uh, call it. Um, and applying kind of clinical scientific reasoning, uh, to, to some of these problems book came out just a couple of years ago that I've been reading uh, called The Myth of, Di of Disenchantment, Magic, Modernity, and the Birth of the Human Sciences. And so what uh, Jason Josephson Storm writes here, he kind of points out a few things. He says that, well, Weber was actually wrong because we're now well into the modern era, you know, we're capitalism is pretty much everywhere now and so on and so forth yet we still find that two out of three americans believe in paranormal activity you know similar numbers in terms of ghosts um and one of the big points that josephson storm makes here is that um is that there never really was this disenchantment that weber and others uh discussed in fact, he points out that someone who we often think of as, you know, one of the first scientists, Isaac Newton, was a magician, and sort of his um, his, some of his laws of physics were, in some cases, kind of a side project compared to his alchemy and some of these other things that he was doing. So jo Josephson Storm is kind of just pointing out that. It wasn't like there was a clean break between, you know, 
the pre-enlightenment and the scientific revolution afterwards um that you know these things have all been myth and and um, all of these things have been kind of wound up uh together um and there are you know many examples of early and current scientists uh in indulging in occult things you would also see sort of this wonder in nature from an evolutionary perspective uh edward o wilson who wrote and did a lot of the um work on on uh, on sociobiology sorry i've got a cat toy all right okay so <clears throat> So anyway, um, Edward O. Wilson, he has something called biophilia, which is this, this uh, term for this feeling of wonder that you get when you go out into nature, that humans have this, this, this urge to be in nature that, you know, we forget about because of, um, you know, watching lectures on screens or whatever it might be. And so he's making an argument that it's you know there's some very deep biology here that um that makes us kind of stand in awe of uh of national um of like the national parks and uh things like that in the united states so when we talk about modern politics then as we have to talk about this increasing rationalization, and a big part of that was the development of the modern nation state, what we today often call countries. So um, there was this war there in, um, in Europe between several different religious sects. Uh, there were a lot of different coalitions. It wasn't necessarily quite clear, clean cut who was fighting who all the time, um, but it ravaged Central Europe for, for quite some time. I think I mistakenly said that that Hobbes had written Leviathan after the Thirty Years' War, and I was, I was, I got messed up. I was thinking of the English Civil War, um, Hobbes writes, Hobbes writes after, after that. Um, anyway, so the Thirty Years' War ended with this peace of Westphalia, and may not seem like it's that important and i don't think that they thought it was uh, as important then but that kind of was the treaty that set up a lot of the boundaries for at least a few of the west the current western uh, european nation states and it set up a a, a structure that many other uh, societies began to follow and the reason was that you know they realized they couldn't have these feudal battles uh, forever anymore and that these, um, you know, that there needed to be some sort of structure to prevent uh, war from happening. As I said, it wasn't the Thirty Years' War, but the English Civil War, near, which was not that <laughs> far away, uh, both geographically or um, chronologically, uh, where Hobbes looks at this world and writes this book Leviathan um, and this is the point in the lecture where you'll say that there's a little clip in the in gaucho space uh, with a little five or six minute video on Hobbes on his his thinking um, and so on so again remember he's also he has sort of a a counterpart that's like comes from about 2,000 uh, years earlier or so. Um, Lord Shang, uh, Shang Yang, um, as I said, better known, better known um, as Lord Shang. Uh, he was born during the Warring States period, and I think I talked about this before, um, and we will talk about it again, but he was essentially, you, you see that it wasn't you know, just some English guy talking about the need for uh, a strong state, um, but you have you have Lord Shang writing about this long before we saw what happened in um, in Europe with the English Civil War and the Thirty Years' War. Now, again, just a reminder that Weber's definition of the state is the organization that has the monopoly on the legitimate use of violence within a territory. 
So again, let that sink in. That's how he defines defines government, essentially. And it kind of goes along with Charles Tilley and what he has said, that war makes states, states make war. Uh, you're all familiar with <laughs> Charles Tilley now and his uh, approach to the development of politics. There are some questions, though. We're living in a time, and we know that, you know, societies collapse. We talked about that last time, state breakdown, um, some of the things that happen uh, that cause that. One of the most important things that you see is that a lot of, oftentimes elites have an illusion of in, invincibility. Um, that basically, you know, the last people to realize that there's going to be a revolution uh, or a coup are the people in government themselves. And in the American government, the sociologist C. Wright Mills writes this book in the 1950s looking at the elites in the country and he basically coined this term the power elite and that refers to this connection between our political systems the military and industry and commerce and all of that and what he noticed was this sort of revolving door between these diff different organizations so people would um, maybe start off in wall street and then run for the senate and then uh, get a job you know consulting for some private firm that's you know been contracted by the pentagon uh, or something like that and so c Wright mills said that you know in the that sociologists who are studying power studying the elite and so on really have to focus on this group in the United States, because that's ultimately where a lot of the power comes from. Well, when a ruling elite is facing a crisis, there's generally three things that they can do. One is they, they can ignore the situation. Uh, that's what the French aristocracy did before before the revolution there. They can increase repression, you know, become even more brutal. Um, that's what started happening in the 1980s in a lot of Eastern European uh, countries that were still under communist rule. Or you can also see that sometimes ruling elites will make sacrifices. An example being Roosevelt's New Deal. Um, although Roosevelt was not popular with the, you know, the very wealthy, and, you know, a lot of them were very much opposed to him. There were plenty who were elites like Roosevelt. Ro Roosevelt came from uh, a very elite family and social class, um, and there were a number of people, wealthier people, who were fine, you know, uh, paying more taxes and so on uh, then. You know, today it's not quite as simple. We see in the United States, you know, conflict between uh, different ruling elites. So the U.S. seems to be trying to do all three of these. Ignore how bad the situation is, um, increase repression, um, and then, you know, asking the ruling elite to make sacrifices. Um, so, so we see Biden's foreign his policies attempting to uh, force some of these elite sacrifices in the sense of um, higher taxes on the wealthy and that sort of thing. So a lot of political theology, we often see that it becomes popular or these sort of ideas become popular during crises and in during times of, of state breakdown. And it's at this moment that we've seen this new, uh, this rise of what some people call the alt-right or radical right or whatever you want to refer to it as. Uh, Mark Sedgwick, an excellent scholar, or religious scholar and so on, uh, he, he has this great book where others um, analyze a number of right-wing, radical right-wing thinkers and philosophers. And Sedgwick identifies four the four key themes in their work. One, this sort of apoc apocalypticism, um, eschatology, millenarianism, which I mentioned before and I'll uh, talk about more today, but basically, you know, this sort of end of the world uh, sort of background. A fear of global liberal elites, so, you know, people at the European Union or the United Nations or uh, universities or whatever it might be and the consequences of Carl Schmitt's friend-enemy distinction. 
And I'll be talking about that again, too, in a, in a moment. And then metapolitics. So politics through means other than, you know, voting and canvassing and things like that, uh, using memes or, you know, creative, creative uses of social media and that sort of thing. Um, TikTok <laughs> videos and, and whatnot. All of these things are, could be considered, uh, meta politics. They're sort of happening. They're political, but they're not happening on quite the same plane as, uh, conventional politics. And I could bring up key thinkers of the far left, but I would probably have to do that in a different lecture. We find that Political theology is primarily found on on the political right, um, for the most part, but not, not completely. Um, you know, as I said, if you want to really get into it, there's there's um, others um, who are Christian, who are Jewish, um, who who are uh, Islamic. I'll talk about that a little bit on on Thursday as well. And some some of the differences between political theology uh, in Islam versus what we would see in the United States or or in um, uh, Christian Christian cultures. So, as I said, we often people often look to to these beliefs during times of collapse, and basically, the collapse of a civilization has this simple basis. There's a mismatch between the maintenance costs of capital and the resources that are available to meet those costs. So capital is beyond just money and beyond just financing here. Um, capital is everything in sort of kind of a Marxist sense. Um, that's roads, infrastructure, information, um, personnel, transportation, infrastructure, all of that stuff uh, is capital, along with actual finance and, and, and money and things like that. The other thing is the maintenance costs, the use of resources to maintain that capital. So in order to have roads um, and, and infrastructure and things like this, uh, you there has to be a lot of mining that happens in order to get certain times kinds of rock or um, stone that that are needed for uh, for infrastructure projects. We often see though that as maintenance costs go up, there tend to be cuts uh, to capital, and that's where you will see cuts to social services or uh, certain programs will be cut down, uh, and so on, and they become sort of the order of the day. So, <clears throat> but people, for the most part, aren't aware of maybe their uh, their place within their within the system and uh, where the resources go. Um, so, for example, you have the middle class in the United States that sometimes people in the middle class uh, complain about welfare, but they expect Medicare and Social Security uh, for, th for themselves. So that tends to be something we, we commonly see. So again, a lot of these thinkers that we're talking about are emerging during times of, of chaos, and so it's good to have that in mind. So one of these first thinkers is Joseph de Maist in uh, French. He was a French noble. He was, um, he, I forgot his, like a baron or something, or a count maybe in Savoy, which was like a small principality at that time. And he was sent to be the, uh, the ambassador to Russia. So he spent a lot of time in in Russia and St. Pete St. Petersburg, he was very religious, and some would say that he was um, kind of a, a precursor to fascism. So he says, I should say, I should mention something else that's very important about him, and that as part of his job when he was younger in, in his life, he did something clerical, but it was with uh, the executioner. So he's you know, he saw a lot of executions, um, and that I think played a big role in his in his view of the world. 
He says, all grandeur, all power, and all subordination to authority rests on the executioner. He is the horror and the bond of a human association. Remove this incomprehensible agent from the world, and that very, and at that very moment, order gives way to chaos, thrones topple, and society disappears. So Demaist is basically saying, you know, you need to have the executioner, which I'm not quite sure how he you know, balance that with his you know, Christian theology about thou shalt not kill. But anyway, he, as many Christians do, he <laughs> found some way to bridge those uh, contradictory things. He also argued in favor of war sometimes, that war is thus divine in itself, since it is a law of the world. War is divine through its consequences of a supernatural nature, which are as much general as particular. <laughs> So if you want to, you know, see the counter-enlightenment, he's probably one of the better-known figures. Um, there's another guy who was writing about the same time uh, named Chateaubriand, who I should have actually added to this lecture too. But anyway, Chateaubriand, not as influential, but he was saying a lot of the same things without <laughs> without sort of the bloodlust uh, that you get out of uh, the work of Demaist. So Chateaubriand was actually a pacifist, but he wanted the the monarchy to stay in place. And Demaist basically felt the same way. He wanted the monarchy and the aristocracy to stay in place. Um, they just had very different ideas about how how society is stabilized uh, or was meant to stabilize an aristocracy. Demaist, repression, <clears throat> Chateaubriand, uh, compromise and, you know, kind of argumentation and, and so on. So I think on the one of the first days of class, we, I mentioned uh, Carl Schmitt, widely acknowledged to be one of the most influential legal scholars, it's highly controversial. You can read a lot of, you know, endless articles uh, analyzing his work. And he actually coined the term political theology. Um, he also had a number of other things. He said basically at the heart of politics, political theology, is the distinction between friend and enemy. And that becomes kind of key in his mind. And he argued that real power is held by the sovereign. And the sovereign, it's not so clear who that is. The sovereign is whoever can suspend the laws, democracy or whatever it may be, um, in order to do something for national security or to, you know, stop a civil war or something like this. And he actually cited Abraham Lincoln um, as a sort of defense or as an example, I should say, of, of the system where, you know, Lincoln had to essentially, uh, you know, enact martial law or what uh, Schmidt and others call a state of exception, where essentially, essentially you, you saw that uh, Abraham Lincoln was the sovereign there, that, you know, he kind of took on the powers of a, of a dictator um, during, during that war, uh, during the Civil War. So, um, interestingly, you know, Schmidt develops these ideas in the 1920s. His main, his main goal was to prevent both the far left or the far right from taking power. His, his, he was trying to do, sort of build upon uh, Hobbes. He was a big fan of Hobbes and basically was saying that, you know, we need to sort of have a updated Hobbes. Now, as I said, he, we don't know, there's a lot of <laughs> argument about this. Um, during the Nazi period, he joined the party for about three years and he wrote um, some anti-Semitic works. Uh, he had censored some Jewish authors. Before the war, or before, and before, you know, the Nazis came to power, I think there were a couple instances of anti-Semitism, but not nearly as much as what you saw after um, the Nazis came to power. After the war, uh, he kind of, he was banned from teaching at any university, uh, but he continued to write and, and, and be uh, continue to be influential.
So as I've said, his work has, has a, sort of made a comeback on both the left and the right for different reasons. Um, anyone who's interested in stability <laughs> would, would be interested in Carl Schmitt's work, even if you, even if he detests you on a personal level. Um, his, again, he, he anchors everything in, in this idea of a, you know, Christian superstructure that, you know, everything else is subordinate ultimately to, uh, to, you know, Christianity. And so that was kind of Hobbes's, I mean, not Hobbes, well, Hobbes too, but, uh, Schmidt's main argument when he developed this political theology. And he argued that a lot of these institutions, well, a lot of these institutions in politics actually come out of, um, come out of theology. He was actually, a lot of his early works when he was writing about these sort of state of exception, this emergency, a friend and enemy, uh, stuff, he was kind of responding to work that had been done by, uh, Bakunin, who was a, an anarchist. He was a philosopher of anarchism. Um, and uh, Giuseppe Mazzini, who was you know, the founder of modern Italy, and some would argue also, you know, kind of a precursor to modern uh, fascism, or at least has had that potential. Another critical figure here, who is, who's kind of like the counter uh, to to uh, Carl Schmidt, would be Walter Benjamin, who wrote at that time. Um, he had, he was very critical of, 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 of Schmidt and, and others. So anyway, Schmidt argues that most modern political concepts come out of theological religious ideas. So you think of individualism, something that we often associate with uh, the rise of the West and the Enlightenment and all of that. Schmidt and others, including myself, would say that actually it goes back further to uh, Christian individual salvation. That's that Christianity is one of the of the first religions, at least you know in that part of the world, that draws people out of their clans, out of their families, and you know has a congregation that exists uh, beyond the family. That was a fairly new development, uh, and. It would take an individual decision to, you know, leave your family and join uh, the Christian church. So already from the very beginning of, you know, Christianity, you see this focus on the individual in a way that you've never really seen before. Um, and that's, you know, that, that proceeds then through, uh, through the centuries. So political theology then is essentially a theory of sovereignty that sovereignty, figuring out who was sovereign, was one of the most important things uh, that could be done. Who can suspend the law in order to save it? That is the sovereign. Basically, there's a civil war. Abraham Lincoln, he, he declares martial law, and you know people's houses are used as quarters, are quartered by soldiers, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the ultimately that you know that power that sovereign power that lincoln had won the war kept the union together and so on and so forth so the state of exception can be used in ways that are you know that promote the freedoms of others and uh perhaps prevent you know other types of uh coercion and despotism uh, from 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 the sort of breaking out. So in 1921, he made this argument about Article 48 in the Weimar Constitution. What's the Weimar Constitution? The Weimar Constitution was the the old German Constitution before before uh, Hitler took power. So. <clears throat> Schmidt argued that Article 48 granted Hindenburg, who was the president at that time, an opportunity to basically, you know, keep the Nazis out um, and keep the more liberal regime uh, in power. But actually, 
kind of backfired because the state of exception, the state of emergency kind of enabled Hitler's rise. I mean, it kind of it provided this legal backdrop for this new Nazism uh, to develop. So Schmidt's arguing that you need a strong government in order to, uh, you know, keep keep society together and uh, keep people from going off and doing you know their own thing all the time and uh, and so on. And it's you know Hitler's kind of saying the same thing except you know more much more radically. And as I said, Schmidt goes in that direction then. And uh, there uh, there'll uh, be another link in the in the modules where you'll see an interview with Miguel Walter, who's written this book, D Divine Democracy, Political Theology After Carl Schmitt. <coughs> and that's where Walter Benjamin comes in, his famous uh, figure who was also looking at the state of exception, but saw it differently. Then Schmidt didn't see it in sort of religious terms. Um, <clears throat> but he also wrote about religion and wrote about um, social constructionism and <coughs> and all of these different things. Um, so as I said, if you read Schmidt, you should probably read Walter Benjamin first, because a lot of Schmidt's writing is in response to stuff that Benjamin had written. Giorgio Agamben is an Italian uh, philosopher. He basically says that modern totalitarianism can be defined as the establishment by means of the state of exception, essentially a legal civil war that allows for the physical elimination not only of political adversaries, but of entire categories of citizens who, for some reason, cannot be integrated into the political system. And so this would describe the Holocaust, this would describe the cultural revolution in China, um, a whole range of different things. A lot of uh, civil wars throughout in various different countries uh, would be, you would see, um, you would see falling into this state of exception. Um, <clears throat> so Agamben has actually written a book called The State of Exception, and I'm actually in the midst of reading it right now, but it's it's essentially kind of an update and kind of pointing out sort of the the history of the the, the term and also looking at how it, how it's been used in history, looking at like ancient Rome and, and various other other places. <clears throat> so Agamben is kind of the scholar who's doing the most work on sovereignty right now, at least philosophical work. Um, he is most recently, most recently written about the powers that have been given to governments as a result of coronavirus and how that coronavirus and, you know, is, is sort of a state of exception where, you know, governments around the world have had to do things that, you know, many of them never expected they would, um, in terms of limiting physical freedoms and things like that. Um, so anyway, he's seems to be quite concerned about what could happen with these new powers that governments governments have. Other kind of interesting things that are connected to political theology. There are other movements that were happening in the late 1800s and early 1900s. This is at the time period the industrial revolution has taken off you know sociology gets started trying to understand all these changes that are happening you also <clears throat> have people leaving their religious faiths trying out new ones so this woman here helen helena blavatsky was a russian immigrant to the united states which is one of the key developers of something called theosophy theosophy is it's a mix of various different religions. Um, it's got a lot of mysticism, <clears throat> borrows from Hinduism and Buddhism, and mixes it with Christianity and kind of European paganism. And 
end anyway. And it's there that you see the the swastika. You know, it's it, it was an occult symbol before it was the symbol of uh, the Nazis. So interestingly, the this Theosophical Society they built up a basically a cult around this guy who was pretty much a kid at this time called G, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti. And he basically abandoned the role. He basically kind of said, I'm not your savior or whoever you think I am. Um, but I am a, a good philosopher and thinker. Um, so he remained very active, but he just was, he was not going to be like their messiah that he kind of, they had kind of thought he would be. There's a picture of him and Annie Besant, who was a famous, famous, uh, British, uh, socialist, theosophist feminist and uh, other things. So uh, Krishnamurti ended up interestingly nearby uh, in in Ojai, in Ojai, California. There's a picture of him. He died, I believe, in the 90s. Um, here's, you can actually hear the recording on YouTube of this talk that he gave um, in in Ojai. And if you go to Ojai today, there's the Krishnamurti uh, Educational Center that kind of teaches his ideas. So he's, he's still very, uh, still, you know, still taken seriously. So theosophy, mixture of all these different things. Then there's something called Ariosophy. Ariosophy is basically a, a branch of theosophy that declared the quote-unquote Indo-Europeans as superior. Indo-Europeans, basically just white people is what that means. Um, but they see this connection between India and the United States. So Area Sophie <coughs> gives birth to this group, the Thule Society. <coughs> Excuse me. And the Thule Society was a group that discussed things like paganism, religion, etc., all, all of these different things. And um, the Arasafi sort of, you know, hitched a ride onto Nazism, and when Nazism fell apart, uh, so did Ariosophy, although it seems to be making a comeback in some weird and interesting ways. So, which brings us to traditionalism. So this is a sort of, <laughs> kind of interesting, a new movement um, that's really developed over the last, been developed, I should say, over the last 20 to 30 years, and it's sort of come out in in popular discourse just in the last, I would say, five years um, during the Trump administration. And so why did it come out? Why did it sort of make an appearance then? Um, one of Trump's advisors at that time, a guy named Steve Bannon, if you follow politics, you undoubtedly have heard of him. Uh, he, early in 2017, gave like a list of his favorite authors or books, and um, there were a lot of these interesting right-wing thinkers uh, who were who call themselves traditionalists, and so the idea here is that you know traditionalists are very much into hierarchies. Uh, they're they're into that sort of aristocratic view that uh, Schmidt held. Um, they're opposed to equality, things like progress, uh, individualism, you know, they don't like socialism or capitalism. Um, all of these things they see as modernity. Modernism is, is the, you know, the big, is the devil figure here. So this is, you know, sort of the biggest, newest development in, in a lot of, I think, in political philosophy right now. One of the leading philosophers in that area is a guy named Julius Evola, who I think most people pronounce his name wrong, but anyway, they say Evola, but it's Evola. Pretty sure about that. <laughs> uh, um, so he, he has this book called Revolt Against the Modern World. And someone's drawn this creepy picture of, and you can see how uh, this could be used for fascist uh, purposes. And that's essentially what happened. Evola was one of uh, Mussolini's advisors. He spent the last years of the Second World War like as an officer with the SS in Germany. Um, he was not, however, uh, he was not necessarily, he didn't have the, he wasn't a Nazi. He, he didn't believe in 
like racial supremacy. He believed in spiritual supremacy. And so that's what that was his primary thing was that, you know, trying to get um, Mussolini and the fascists in Italy and, you know, Hitler and the Germans and uh, and the Nazis in Germany to embrace the, this traditionalism. But not everyone wanted, uh, you know, these traditional ideals. There were plenty of people who uh, were very modern and, you know, thought that, that fascism and Nazism were the, the for, at the forefront of modernity. Anyway, if you are interested in sort of traditionalist thought, there's a, a good book by a guy in the middle of Kansas uh, called The Case Against the Modern World, a Crash Course in Traditionalist Thought. Um, the other one that I would, that's pro that probably goes even deeper, um, is this Against the Modern World, Traditionalism and the Secret Intellectual History of the 20th Century. It's uh, written by Mark Sedgwick. He edited that volume of right-wing thinkers that I talked about a few moments ago. So also connections then back to De Maist. Um, you start to see, I mean, De Maist is kind of a big figure amongst the traditionalist, uh, traditionalists. And so, you know, if you really want to understand traditionalism, you have to read some of De Maist uh, to, to really get how to understand the, the movement and the counter-movement against it. So, <clears throat> this is a book that I think is out of print right now, but it's a fantastic book called Reactionary Modernism, Technology, Culture, and Politics in uh, Weimar and the Third Reich. And it talks about how technology essentially was used to be anti-technological, anti if that makes any sense, um, to, to spread the ideas of, you know, these traditionalist values, or, or in some cases, these, you know, uh, ultra-modern Nazi ideas and so on, and talking about how technology was used to do that. And you see similar things today with, you know, uh, groups like Al-Qaeda, who spread their message of wanting to go back to the 7th century, you know, over Twitter or something like this, uh, you know, making use of modern technology to spread, you know, very, very old archaic uh, ideas. So, um, I am going to stop there now, and, uh, you know, the rest of the time you, you can use to uh, watch the videos. The first one is about Hobbes. Um, the second one... Uh, talks about Walter Benjamin, and uh, anyway, when on, in class on uh, Wednesday, then we will continue talking about talking about this political theology uh, and some of the major figures in the contemporary political theology and some of its effects. Um, so anyway, I look forward to that uh, discussion in class on Wednesday. All right, everyone, have a good week.